All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Alpe Özer, I'm Dean of the Jimmy and Rosalind Card School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, roundtable uh, discussions on Afghanistan. And this panel is entitled Afghanistan, one year on under the Taliban rule and its future peace and security trajectories. Uh, we are organizing this uh, panel as part of our Peace Week. A, a, something that we organize twice a year, one in fall, another one in uh, spring. And um, the main purpose of the Peace Week is really to bring a wide range of uh, different types of events and, and really reach out to different audiences. And, uh, and today's um, uh, panel on Afghanistan um, uh, is, is gonna be quite something. Uh, we have an excellent panel for you. And, and the topic is just so um, interesting in many ways, uh, because uh, since um, the Taliban's control of Afghanistan back in August 2021, it's now one year on. And then obviously at the time, so much has been written and, uh, and Afghanistan was number one news item, uh, at least here in the US. Um, around that time, but obviously since then the world has changed quite a bit. Uh, the war in Ukraine has become uh, much more prominent uh, in the media. But nevertheless, what's been happening in Afghanistan uh, is so important for those who are interested in peace and conflict matters globally. Uh, and hence, we are holding this uh, roundtable discussions to focus on the present and, and also the future of Afghanistan. So collectively, uh, we made the decision that because so much really being kind of discussed about the, uh, the failures of um, the whole uh, kind of uh, process and the international intervention and why and how, uh, how the Taliban uh, managed to uh, take over uh, control of Afghanistan, um, over the uh, last year, we don't want to kind of go into that uh, subject that much, but we really want to kind of focus on uh, what's been happening uh, in the space of security, human rights, and humanitarian challenges over the last year, and, and also what's coming, what is in store for Afghanistan in the uh, kind of the near and mid future. So uh, already um, uh, there are numerous reports emanating from Afghanistan that indicate the gradual breakdown of the state and the nation as a whole. So on the one hand, Afghanistan has been unable to preserve the achievements of the previous 20 years. And on the other end, there are many reports that Afghanistan has progressively reemerged as a safe haven for international terrorism. So with all that in mind, um, in this panel, we will first focus on how the situation in Afghanistan has changed over the past year. And second, where Afghanistan is heading to in terms of its security development and human, human rights frameworks. So we'll be talking about the future of Afghanistan. And that part I think will be particularly interesting because I asked my panelists uh, to kind of like do a little bit of fortune telling in a way, kind of like imagining the future. I think, you know, they are gonna share their uh, kind of vision of Afghanistan in the near future and what might be happening there. So let me start by introducing my panel. I'll start with Mansur Essan. Uh, Dr. Essan is a scholar here at the Carter School. Uh, he's a residence uh, scholar uh, and uh, he's a seasoned political analyst uh, who specializes in Afghanistan and Central Asia studies. His scholarly interests include nation state building, democratization, and political Islam. And uh, Dr. Essan's current research focuses on the analysis of Islamic radicalism terrorism and its implications for regional and global security. Next, um, we have uh, Dr. Hogai Ayubi. Uh, she's a post postdoc fellow here at the Carter School. Uh, she received her PhD at the University of Cambridge and worked as an intern at the Afghanistan Office of the President and the Afghanistan Ministry of Education. 
And uh, she, she's a member of a number of uh, really important organizations such as uh, Teach for America Co. And, and uh, she's also a Leadership for Educational Equity uh, Fellow. And she was a Fulbright Scholar in Turkey. My third panelist is uh, Mirveis Balki. Uh, Dr. Balki is a nation building expert. He works on nation building from education and theology perspectives. He was previously a faculty member at Georgetown University, Qatar, and is currently a fellow at the Wilson Center. The last but not least, uh, my fourth panelist is Dr. Nilifar Saki. Dr. Saki is a visiting research fellow at the Krupp Institute of International Peace Studies at, an, at the Notre Dame University. And uh, she's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. She's been teaching courses as a professional lecturer of international affairs at Elliott School of George Washington University. And she has just published a book entitled Human Security and Agency, Reframing Productive Power in Afghanistan. So without any further ado, let's start. And my first question to our panelists is, how has the situation in Afghanistan changed over the past year? So let's deal with that first. What really has changed over the past year? And I will ask my panelists uh, to deal with this question from their area of expertise. So Nilifar, if, if I may, I'd like to start with you. Can you give us an overview of what has changed in Afghanistan over the past year uh, from a political settlement and peace process perspective? Right, over to you, Nilifar. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, um, Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution for organizing this panel on Afghanistan. It's always timely and always critical, um, the issue of Afghanistan and, and um, it's all um, sectors. Well, uh, uh, let me start with the with what, what happened and what is happening right now, as you asked the question. Um, uh, on, on the 15th of August last year, um, a, a, a newly um, established, I would say, a republic, fragile republic, was replaced by a totalitarian system uh, that Taliban uh, took over, takeover caused. So the country has uh, transformed drastically um, in many aspects, political aspects, security lands, development and, and uh, uh, governance. Um, the Taliban, um, as um, uh, quite uh, clear from their background, they are a, um, a militant ideologist, uh, they are hardliners, and they had a history in Afghanistan in 1990s. Uh, so they actually don't have a good history and got good track record. Uh, therefore, it created a lot of frustration, fear at the beginning when, they, when the takeover happened. And there was a, a exodus of people uh, from uh, Afghanistan to different neighboring countries and outside because of that fear uh, and frustration uh, among the, uh, the, the people. Um, um, I, I would like to just articulate my statement in a few, and, and few areas, security, governance, and human rights. From security perspective, the Taliban takeover uh, uh, has caused some reduction of violence based on the reports. If we compare the, uh, the, the viol violence be before 2021 and violence now, but that the, the nature of violence has changed. It, it reduced only number of attacks, direct attacks, but the, uh, the other kinds of violence has emerged and took place in society, which I think uh, that has, is, is challenging. Um, the, on the other, also on the security aspect, the, the, the Taliban takeover, the emergence of new uh, terrorism in, in the country, and emergence of new terrorist groups and organization of those terrorist groups in Afghanistan and different parts of Afghanistan, the reorganization of Al-Qaeda, the involvement of the uh, Tahrik Taliban in Pakistan and other uh, insurgent groups uh, from the north, uh, northern uh, countries in the region. They all uh, started reorganizing themselves, which um, does not look uh, uh, give a good picture of security at this point. Um, to uh, Afghan people, uh, also uh, to the region. 
from a, a governance perspective, uh, the Taliban has attempted to govern by creating a interim government, um, uh, which was composed of all the high hardliners um, and the old guards of the Taliban. Um, no, no women, of course, and no uh, minorities were involved. Only three uh, from other ethnic groups who were part of the uh, interim government, but it was um, uh, totally restricted to one ethnic group that Taliban belonged to. So um, uh, that was a setup that they created initially in order to govern the country, but due to lack of um, uh, capabilities within the, um, uh, the, the government structure that they created, I think there are uh, uh, lots of issues re in relation to governance, particularly humanitarian and development. And with the um, Taliban takeover, there has been a reduction of uh, international funding, not reduction, actually com complete collapse of international funding to Afghanistan for a period, a number of uh, months. That caused a severe humanitarian crisis, which followed, of course, by the development crisis with all the money which are which is uh, frozen and many other issues. So overall, the human there are right now in the country, there's a dire humanitarian and economic crisis. According to WF report, half of the population doesn't have anything to eat. And there is a fair winter is coming. So there's more fear in relation to uh, uh, humanitarian crisis that people will face during the winter. And in relation to human rights, uh, the third area that I wanted to highlight a little bit about uh, that is, um, of course, that's a totalitarian system. And uh, the Taliban uh, ideology is based and, and rooted in a totalitarianism. So with that, it means they started suppressing the progressive segment of society. They started suppressing the women groups, they started suppressing all the human rights organizations. Freedom of expression was under threat. Journalists were detained and, 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 and uh, killed at some point and tortured at, uh, during five to six months of the of the Taliban takeover. And I think that is the nature of totalitarianism. The, uh, the characteristics of, of, of a system is to suppress the progressive in order to uh, uh, convert the population uh, into a obedient masses. And I think they did, they did it initially. They started by the, through um, extrajudicial killing, detention, uh, warnings, torture, kill, and, and many other uh, uh, um, atrocities. They started um, imposing their hardline rules on society, which uh, uh, that also was uh, 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 added to the grievances of the people uh, throughout the country. So overall, these three areas that we had, that at least we have seen from last one year was under serious threat since the Taliban takeover. And according to latest report, 6,000 people on daily basis only leave the country um, to, uh, for Iran. And now let's, I don't have the other data about the other countries, I was looking for that, but only 6,000 people on daily basis, they are migrating to Iran. So now uh, the other um, countries have the same or, or more this number. And all because of this number of uh, uh, areas that I highlighted, lack of good governance, and humanitarian development uh, crisis that people have faced, and above most, the atrocities that restricts people's freedom uh, and participation in, in society. And of course, on the, on the top of everything, we have their, um, uh, it's called a gender apartheid right now under Taliban system, because they uh, banned secondary school for girls, there were uh, restrictions on women political participation and um, restrictions on women um, uh, engagement in various sectors and public and private life. So there has been a total uh, 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 dark time for women, uh, specifically during Taliban time. So I stop there and then if there'll be question or concern, I just answer during the session. Thank you. Thank you, Nilfar. I mean, obviously, yes, you are uh, uh, painting a very bleak, dark picture of the experience of Afghans under the Taliban rule in all aspects, from government, uh, governance, human rights, and, uh, and security. And, and the numbers you are sharing with us, just kind of the evidence of that. And uh, clearly, the experience of the last uh, year or more uh, has been really tough for many Afghans, and many of them have already left. And uh, so with that overview, I think we had a really good start now. Let's move to uh, Mansur. 
And I want to ask Mansur the same question about what's changed in Afghanistan over the last year, but from a more security perspective. So Nilufar has already started uh, to unpack some of these issues, but Mansur, what's been like uh, you know, in the space of security in Afghanistan over the last one year? Thanks, uh, Professor Alps, for having me in this panel. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm looking uh, to uh, the changes taken place since a year from uh, security perspectives uh, since the Taliban returned to powers in uh, power uh, on August 15, 2021. Uh, uh, so this, this uh, return of Taliban had not only uh, uh, affected Afghanistan, but it had uh, uh, wider regional and global implications uh, than uh, uh, So the Taliban returned to power after 20 years as all the transnational uh, terrorist organization to reestablish their bases in Afghanistan and recruit, uh, like we see uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, top leaders, Emin al-Zawahiri was in Kabul and he was uh, targeted by the US uh, drone there. So uh, this uh, symbiotic uh, relation between the Taliban and other transnational uh, organizations is not a new thing, uh, and it is not surprising as by uh, now uh, uh, when they return back to Afghanistan. So the Taliban have served a breathing ground uh, for the regional global terrorism ever since uh, they succeeded uh, uh, to, seize, uh, to seize more than 90% uh, of Afghanistan territory during the second half of uh, 1990s. And we also see that during the first uh, period of the Taliban uh, during uh, 1990s, Al-Qaeda and its regional affiliates, uh, such as the, uh, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and also the Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement began to grow very rapidly. Uh, it is also in 1998 that Osama uh, returned back to Afghanistan and he established a, a, a terrorist camp for uh, 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 training more than 1,500 uh, members in Jaji district of uh, Paktia province. Uh, uh, likewise, the uh, Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement began to develop at uh, uh, at, at, at during that time, uh, and especially when the Osama bin Laden allocated uh, funds for the Eastern Turkestan uh, um, uh, movement. So uh, I am mentioning these few examples because I want to highlight the Taliban's involvement in promoting and supporting regional and global terrorism. Uh, and it, it shows that they had a very central role during uh, uh, their first uh, uh, period of ruling in Afghanistan. And uh, Taliban's intimate relations with Al-Qaeda led them to prefer even going to war against the United States during that time than uh, just handing over bin Laden to the United States. Similarly, uh, like the relations are so close and, uh, and uh, separ inseparable that uh, when the uh, uh, United States intervened in Afghanistan and most of the uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and uh, Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement members, they were uh, killed in the northern, north, north, northern province of Afghanistan. Then they escaped to the Waziristan area and they uh, received uh, uh, help and uh, sanctuary uh, uh, from the TTP. Uh, and also the Al-Qaeda, the Taliban there. So the evidence also shows that the relation between Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, and other the, uh, affiliated uh, terrorist organizations has improved further during the 20 years of war uh, against uh, the Afghanistan government, uh, the US and the NATO. During the last two decades, uh, if we uh, observe the uh, Al-Qaeda, the IMU, AT, uh, uh, IM, and the TTP, they all actively participated in war against the United States, against the Afghanistan government and the international forces. So Taliban are not the only ones who are proud of, uh, even now believe they 
defeated the United States and then the NATO and conquered the power by force. Uh, but all of these terrorist uh, groups also consider themselves partner in this honor. So the relation between the Taliban and the terrorist organization, including the Al Qaeda and all the others uh, branches, like uh, I already mentioned, the IMU uh, and the ETIM, uh, is not just a uh, simple organizational relation. So I believe it is an uh, ideological uh, and it's a strategic relations. And uh, 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 the ideological uh, uh, relation among these organizations convinced them even to protect each other by uh, their blood, such as the Taliban did that one in the uh, case of Osama bin Laden uh, in 2001. Since, uh, uh, so, uh, in, uh, is, I believe it is quite naive to believe uh, and expect the Taliban will break their ties with uh, Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations in the region. Because uh, this perception, uh, like, uh, 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 I think, uh, 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 the ideological perception and uh, uh, among all these uh, uh, organizations that is very fundamental and that uh, guaranteed their survival and success. Uh, and, and so uh, I want to uh, uh, just uh, uh, conclude this one, uh, that, that the extensive presence of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan after the return of Taliban to power in 2021, more evidently, uh, 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 the assassination of Al Qaeda top leader Zaman al Zawahiri in one of the Sarajuddin Aqani residence in Kabul city, and also the prominence dominance of uh, IMU and uh, ATIM members, especially in the northern provinces of Afghanistan, could be quite convincing examples for the world to see the real essence of the Taliban as in. Uh, separable ally of the, and supporter of the global terrorism, than portraying them as a genuine national resistant forces. I want to conclude my, uh, 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 just, just to, uh, 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 I think, yeah, I don't have the time for uh, yeah. talking about the uh, ISK and, uh, yeah, thank you. Master, we can come, up, come back to some of these issues in the second round, but what we are saying is that um, uh, Afghanistan, has really become a hotbed for global and uh, regional terrorism. And I mean, uh, some of these groups that you just mentioned, and uh, this may be my personal ignorance, but you know, like, because we don't really hear about this so much at the moment. And uh, I think the international focus is so much on Ukraine and other places, the Afghanistan, and what's been ha happening in Afghanistan in the space of uh, uh, security and terrorism. You know, uh, that hasn't been really kind of like a, a primary focus, but I'm sure it will because all these uh, terrorist organizations we just mentioned, you know, one day um, um, they will start to uh, become a problem uh, for the West. And, uh, and I wonder whether we'll enter this kind of cycle of Taliban sporting other terrorist organizations and then the some sort of another military intervention will be coming to Afghanistan. Perhaps this is kind of something that we can talk about in the last part, but you know, the, the picture you are painting uh, is that while the situation of uh, kind of the security situation in Afghanistan is really kind of getting bad to worse and particularly you know, with the issue of like the global and regional terrorism. So thank you very much for that. And now I wanna to move to Mirais and, and I wanna talk about uh, kind of what's happened over the last year from the nation building perspective. Because Mirais, uh, over the last 20 years, like the Bonn uh, uh, Agreement, kind of the process afterwards, you know, Afghanistan seemed to be changing so much in many ways. And one of the things that, you know, like this whole Afghan identity in many ways that kind of was emerging and, uh, and uh, you know, it was almost like a sense that, you know, Afghanistan was coming together with these different ethnicities, with these regions and all that. Uh, but uh, what we heard from uh, Nilifar and Masur, that has been kind of dissolving, kind of like disappearing. So 
uh, can you just elaborate that for us, please? What's been happening around that nation building and the way that's kind of damaged over the last year? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Alzardim. Uh, I also on my behalf thank you and the Carter School for Peace and Resolution for having me here. Uh, I heard uh, uh, Dr. Sahiz and Dr. Ehsan's perspective uh, on Afghanistan's past one year, uh, but uh, since, since maybe 10 years, since 2014, I'm always crying that the major intervention in Afghanistan is the nation building process because we, we missed one of the most important and milestone of uh, resolving all the issues, especially the Afghanistan conflict. Um, I believe that uh, in the aftermath of the Bonn Agreement in Afghanistan, we had two major conflicts. Uh, uh, on the one side, there was uh, historical versus religious nation building. And on the other side, inside the religious approach of nation building, we had a, a new Hanafi, Hanafi school of uh, that nation building approach and then the Salafi approach of nation building. So uh, there was not a clear roadmap on how to build a nation who are 99.9% uh, .9 Muslim and uh, with, with majority of the Hanafi uh, in the country, but with the total this deconstruction of the Afghanistan society, especially in the aftermath of uh, a civil, civil war in the country, there was no a clear definition of the identity, nationhood in the country. So what we missed in Bonn what we missed in the uh, 20 years uh, from 2001 to 2021 was a roadmap for nation building in the country. So what happened in the past one year when Taliban, they ruled over Afghanistan, the religious approach of nation building won against the historical perspective in the country and uh, especially the, the, the Salafi approach of nation building in Afghanistan. Because at least for the Hanafi uh, school, there is, uh, especially the new Hanafite in Afghanistan, uh, there is administratively uh, a group, uh, there's a pers perspective that a group of Muslims, they can live within a territorial boundary for the administration and for, for the peace and uh, welfare, uh, which is a sub a subvert of uh, nationhood under the Ummah concept. So the, the concept of Afghanistan, the concept of the people of Afghanistan, the territorial boundaries of Afghanistan was somehow uh, uh, resolved for the for the ulama in Afghanistan, and they did not have any. A contradiction against that. That is why the ulama they were supporting the government of Afghanistan and also the uh, perspective of uh, nation nationhood in, in the country. But now uh, the Taliban, as Dr. Mansour was saying, that a symbolic living with with other Salafi groups and also Afghan Arabs who have been in Afghanistan since jihad time, uh, since eighties. And uh, there is no a clear perspective of, of uh, nationhood in, in the country. On the one side, they are talking about a deconstruction of the uh, historical approach in the country, as well as the Hanafite uh, school approach. As though some of the ulama in Afghanistan, they uh, always talk about the Hanafite approach of nation building, but uh, they are totally influenced by the uh, the new Hanbalism school in Afghanistan. They follow some of the Ikhwan al-Muslims and some of the Al-Qaeda, some of the, uh, the radical ideologues in the Islamic world, Abu Yahya, Libya, Musab, Suri. All these people, they have influenced the nationhood approach of the Afghan ulama uh, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the past 20 years. So, now the Taliban, especially when they are uh, in power, they are following the same approach. And sometimes they're concerned that, okay, if it is Afghanistan, then what about the 
Muslim uh, jihadist brothers who have been with us in the front and who were fighting against the, the, the established uh, 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 governments in Central Asia and, for example, many other countries in the neighboring Afghanistan who are called non-Islamic for, for, for these radicals. Uh, uh, on the other side, they are also going for the roadmap and strategies which are written during the 80s in Afghanistan, the books of Abdullah Azam, the books of many other radicals who are now the Bibles of the radicals in Afghanistan, and they cannot come out of that closet because they have to follow the same promises and the same honors that they, are, they had during jihad and during the 80s in Afghanistan. So uh, uh, from that perspective, nowadays in Afghanistan, the past one year, what they are doing is they are somehow trying to follow the objectives, which is not a clear objective. Again, I say because different Taliban have different rules there in Afghanistan. But one of the major intervention they are following is the education sector in the country, because verbally they are announcing uh, in all the schools and religious madrasas, a, a kind of nationhood uh, perspective and terminology, which is coming from their uh, the radical uh, and sometimes from the tribal background, because uh, they, they believe that these perspectives uh, can, uh, can make a strong nation in Afghanistan and the Afghan nation. Uh, and that's, that's what they are following. So uh, in the past one year, radicalization of the verbal curriculum is a priority to the Taliban government. That is why recently yesterday, they, uh, they changed the Minister of Education in Kabul. What we heard from Kabul from the people that the previous minister was a little bit uh, in favor of the girls' education. And that's why he was arguing against the, the top leadership, the supreme leader of Taliban, Mullah Ibatullah. And that is why he was contradicting some of the decrees of uh, Mullah Haibatullah. That's why he was removed and a new minister who has a very radical background. And he was the, 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 the head of the Darul Ifta of Kandahar province in the southern Afghanistan. He is replaced as the minister of uh, education. So, so what, what I'm concerned uh, highly is that the, the, the small hatch of uh, at least uh, educating girls in the, in the secondary level or in the elementary level. In, in some provinces, the highest school level, uh, I believe that uh, the, these people, uh, they stop that also, they ban that also, and they would not go any, any uh, uh, you know, uh, facility for, for the girls. And not only for the girls, but also for, for, for the boys, because the overall education situation is worse in Afghanistan. So uh, that is the, the, the scenario that, that we have uh, in conclusion on, on the one way. It's a religious Salafi approach of uh, nationhood or nation building in Afghanistan uh, with, with their own desire. And on the other side, uh, some of the tribal leadership of the Taliban, they are prevailing their own uh, local identity over Afghanistan, which is also amalgamated with the radical approach of nation building. Thank you. Mirais, thank you so much. I mean, that's a very complex picture, but the way you presented it, the kind of like particular approach to nation building being deconstructed and not being replaced by another and the theological perspective with that and tribal perspective with that and what's been happening uh, in Afghanistan over the last year. And I think that really allows us to see kind of like some of the um, major changes, particularly in the area of education, for example, or women's access to education. That really kind of makes a lot more sense in terms of what's happening in governance, what's happening with the kind of nation building and how come that then at the end we see kind of like the results of this in terms of particular policies or responses in certain areas. And with that, now I wanna to move to uh, Hogai and, and I want uh, Hogai to focus on the issue of uh, women and girls and, uh, and their particular uh, situation in Afghanistan over the last year. And uh, uh, in the media, we see so many reports, Hogai, that, you know, it's a 
quite a bleak uh, kind of environment uh, for being a woman in Afghanistan today. But over to you, just give us a kind of a sense of what's been happening in Afghanistan for women. Right, thank you. Um, so in Afghanistan, there are several different things that have been happening, um, mostly unfortunately negative because Afghanistan is the only country on earth that has a ban on girls attending school past sixth grade. Um, in the past year, women held no cabinet positions in the Taliban administration, which has basically abolished the, um, they've abolished the Ministry of Women's Affairs, effectively eliminating women's right to political participation. The Taliban have also barred women from working most jobs outside the home. Restrictions of women's movement and bodies continues to escalate. In May this year, the Taliban decreed that women must cover their faces in public. Women have also been instructed to remain in their homes, except in cases of necessity. Women are banned from traveling long distances without a male chaperone, and unchaperoned women are increasingly being denied access to essential services. So as you can see across the board, the rights of women from girls to women actually across ages has declined. And so since the Taliban have taken over, we can see that their active participation in society has been um, degraded. Thank you, Ogai. Uh, you finished there? Oh. I, yeah, I, do you want to hear more? Okay. No, well, in fact, this will be kind of a, a good uh, segue to my second question. And in fact, I can start with you on my second question because I really want to know kind of like how that, uh, I mean, all, all these challenges, you know, uh, you uh, share with us. And obviously we are really doing kind of like the uh, sampling of different issues. I mean, there's obviously so much more to talk about Afghanistan, but we are just, you know, with the uh, time constraints, we're just focusing on a few things. So with women and their access to education, I mean, you know, like what you're saying is that life for women in Afghanistan is about restrictions, bans, and human rights abuses, really kind of like, is this a summary of it? So my next question is really, um, how are those challenges being responded over the last year? So, you know, um, because again, I want to start with you, okay? Uh, some of the things that I see in the media and uh, the reports I'm reading, you know, women are really reacting, those women in Afghanistan, they're really, I mean, as much as they could, they are uh, trying to hold on to their rights. I mean, they are protesting. And uh, so uh, can you just give us a sense of like, you know, the responses to these challenges for women in Afghanistan? Yes, definitely. Wait, am I muted? No, okay. Yeah, okay. So, thank you. So I'm not saying that life was perfect before the Taliban. There was obviously challenges in the previous administrations and uh, women have been suffering even before the Taliban came in, but it has been much more challenging. I mean, from the very basic essentials of like going to school. So the support that women are receiving, I mean, astoundingly has been a very little from the outside. So the UN has denounced the exclusion of Afghan girls from school, but has not acted on their concern. Um, just yesterday, Secretary Blinken at the United States finally has announced the launch of a new, US, a new US initiative. So the Alliance for Afghan Women's Economic Resilience, which is a partnership that's supposed to help improve access to education and training, expand job opportunities, all of these things in Afghanistan, but this hasn't started yet, but I do expect great pushback from the Taliban. So although we're seeing some initiatives from different countries, um, there has been massive amounts of pushback. Um, so what I can say from what I have seen and what, from what I've heard from my family on the ground, from the research that's being done on the ground, from the media on the ground, is that who's actually helping Afghan women? It is other Afghan women. So just recently, an article published showed the immense work that Afghan women are doing in Afghanistan. That is from counseling other women to being active activists, taking to the streets. Um, and it seems like a lonely fight because um, most of the outside um, NGOs and the countries just have not come in to help. 
And so I think the big challenge here is a Taliban administration being the gatekeepers and deciding for women and deciding who is able to come in and even the funds that are being put into the country, um, having a say and sort of keeping the gate closed for women. Do you want me to fortune tell or is that later? No, not yet, not yet. I'll come to that. And uh, But uh, what you said earlier, like Afghan women fighting for Afghan women, I think that's really interesting kind of uh, the phenomenon, right? We are facing in Afghanistan. And, and uh, probably the last 20 years, uh, you know, what I heard from a number of you, those uh, gains were not that great, but at least for women, their participation in governance, in politics, in education, in work, you know, there were many improvements. Now it seems that there's a kind of a, um, a total change in that space that the women really uh, went back to the kind of the first era of Afghanistan in the 1990s. When I visited the Kabul, I think it was 1997, it was exactly that kind of picture, right? women had no access and in fact including women had really restrictions in accessing health as well as education at the time so i'm really worried that uh, okay it may even come to that you know now is education it may be even now the kind of uh, uh, health um, matters uh, soon because the taliban seems to have no kind of boundaries when it comes to women's rights it's just like uh, it's almost like the whole movement is about what they can do against women and the kind of restricting women's rights. What, what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's shocking because they keep saying we want these women to go to female doctors, but if you're not allowing girls to go to secondary school and then they're not getting the university education to become doctors, then do you just not want women to go to the doctor? I mean, there was a poem that uh, a young girl was saying in Afghanistan and it really struck me a couple of years ago. And it said, you won't allow me to go to school. I won't become a doctor. Remember this, one day you will be sick. And so what we've seen from Afghan girls is that they've done extraordinary strides. I mean, just, I think it was last year, the valid, like the um, highest achieving Concours exam was a little girl, you know, um, was a girl who, scored higher than just anybody in the country. And so you're seeing a lot of talent. You're seeing the girls robotics team, like you're seeing so much talent in all of these Afghan girls, it's just not being realized. And you're basically blocking half of the population from um, economic opportunities, from their own medical welfare, from schooling. I mean, it's just unheard of. It's unreal yeah yeah okay okay now let me move to my other panelists and uh, with the question of you know what's been happening like responses over the last year uh but can i just ask you to keep your comments to three to five minutes at this round because i, I really want to kind of leave time for q a at the end and by the way for our audience if you have any q a uh, questions you can put them in the chat and then we will be able to, at least in the last 15, 20 minutes to uh, deal with them. So three to five minutes for each of you. Um, Mirvais, can I come to you? Uh, in your initial comments, you mentioned education being part of a nation building and its importance. And like in any peace building and nation building, obviously, clearly that's the most important area uh, uh, of concern and of focus. So around that education, you know, the challenges that created by Taliban over the last year, uh, what responses uh, you have observed uh, to deal with that? Uh, well, uh, what, I, what I told in the beginning that uh, uh, there was, although a, a curriculum textbook from the government of Afghanistan, to all schools and uh, religious madrasas, but uh, uh, in the areas under the Taliban, they were always teaching a verbal uh, curriculum. So now when they are in power, they are somehow trying to incorporate all these verbal uh, curriculum into the textbooks. That is why recently 
they have started to, to bring reform in the curriculum of Afghanistan uh, education system. So what they did is uh, somehow to Islamicate the, the curriculum by the name of removing some of the democratic, secular, westernized texts from the social science books. Uh, that's why now they are somehow uh, working on that. Although there is resistance even from the traditional ulema, the historical ulema that I was talking about against the Taliban, uh, they, they, even in the uh, Friday khutbas, they, they stood against uh, these policies uh, in the country. But, uh, uh, anyway, they are following uh, uh, their, their own policies. Uh, what measures have been taken uh, since last year? Uh, on the one field, internationally, we are campaigning against uh, these policies and we are working a group of the uh, supporters of education in Afghanistan at different levels uh, with the uh, institutions, uh, international institutions of education, with the ambassadors, uh, with the countries who were supporting uh, the Taliban. For example, I was in Doha, I was speaking with the uh, different officials at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Doha, uh, not let Taliban to change the, the current curriculum of in the education system, although the current curriculum of the education system in Afghanistan was also written by the ulema of Afghanistan, uh, not by the secular groups, because there was that kind of sensitivity in Afghanistan. And that's why the then Minister of Education, uh, Mr. Atmar, collected ulema and he got the endorsement of the ulema for, for the textbook. So, uh, we were speaking with the with 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 the, the Taliban leadership. I met the Minister of Education, uh, the the previous Minister of Education, who was removed yesterday, um, um, Mr. Muni, and I told him that the current textbook is also written by the by the ulema of Afghanistan. We have the endorsement of the ulema. No need to change or bring change. Uh, if you bring change, bring some of the competency-based education to the children of Afghanistan, not some of the radicalized texts so that they are uh, changing to a very burdened generation to this uh, country and also to the region. So uh, that kind of pressure, that kind of campaigning uh, from inside Afghanistan, from outside Afghanistan, we are bringing, but unfortunately, uh, we do not see any positive uh, aspect on that because the Taliban they, they, they are clever now. That's why the, the media, they are saying that the Taliban are changed. I also believe that they are changed. They are now more clever than the past rule because uh, uh, diplomatically, they speak one word, but uh, in action, they are, they are going their own ways in Afghanistan. In all the meetings at different levels, they were promising not to bring any change, any kind of change to the textbooks in the schools. But but uh, in, in action they are bringing. That's why uh, the recent there are humors, although I'm, 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 I'm not uh, sure about it, but there is possibility that they are bringing the textbooks of the 90s again in action in the school system. And the texts of these books were very much ideologic. I was uh, one of the, from the, that time generation, I was reading those textbooks and I learned those textbooks. And it, it was talking all, always about how to kill a communist, how to bombardment somewhere, the enemies, and then they were multiplying, they were uh, adding and, you know, uh, removing us. So, so all, uh, even the algebra and the mathematics was also very much ideologic. So if they bring the same curriculum, which was unfortunately supported by Nebraska and published by Nebraska at that time. Uh, that is a danger to the, to the generation in Afghanistan, to the young generation. That's why I said not only for girls, but education is uh, the highest concern of the whole uh, generation in Afghanistan. For all. Yes. 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 That's a really uh, good point that you are making about like, uh, the way the education and the way they are changing will have such a long-term impact for you know on future generations of Afghanistan. And uh, now let me move to uh, Mansoor. 
in your opening remarks, Mansur, you talk about global and regional terrorism. So what has been the reaction from the uh, global elite uh, to this new Afghanistan becoming the hotbed of terrorism? What, they, what they've been doing and kind of, and for example, um, how does that inform Afghanistan-US relations at the moment? Uh, thanks, Professor. Uh, yeah, before uh, responding to your questions, uh, I want to clear the picture there for the security in three stages, uh, for, uh, which is the security concern uh, at Afghanistan level and also at the regional stage. And uh, another is uh, trade to the global security. So uh, for uh, at the national stage, uh, which is concerned with security threats to Afghanistan, has we see that the Taliban have uh, disregarded all laws and conventions so far relating to all humanitarian uh, issues. Despite the Taliban promises to general amnesty, so Taliban regularly targeted the ex-military and security forces so far in Afghanistan, and this is going on. They have committed genocide ethnic cleansing in numerous provinces of Afghanistan. It is started with Kandahar at the beginning, and now the Panjshir, Baghlan, Sarapol, Faryab, and Jawuzjan. So these are all like the places or the provinces that Taliban committed uh, uh, ethnic cleansing or genocide there. Mass incarceration, torture, the execution of Afghanistan citizens without trial, or frequent uh, atrocities uh, committed by the Taliban and other affiliated organizations on daily basis. While from a broader uh, security viewpoint, like my friends uh, uh, they uh, mentioned there, like the famine, uh, famine, unemployment, lack of health uh, here, as well as the deprivation of Afghanistan residents from their very fundamental rights, uh, including the women's right to education, jobs, likewise freedom of thought, freedom of speech, uh, or uh, ongoing challenges that Afghanistan citizen enduring every day. Considering regional security concerns, the expansion of terrorism under the Taliban administration in Afghanistan appears very crucial. Each of these radical organizations emerged to pursue a particular agenda in addition to their global common objectives that keep them uh, united. For instance, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan major goal is to topple the political regime in Central Asia, particularly in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and establish a Sharia governed Islamic state. Uh, likewise, the Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement main uh, regional agenda is to fight against the Chinese province in uh, Xinjiang region. And their ultimate goal is to establish an independent state called the Eastern Turkestan. Likewise, we see that the primary object of, objective of the Tahrike uh, Talabai Pakistan or the TPP is uh, to undermine the Islamabad uh, influence in Fatah region and also the neighboring Khyber Pakhtunkhwa uh, provinces in Pakistan. So all of these organizations, they have regional agenda and Al-Qaeda has close tie with each of these organizations, except from ISK, which was founded uh, uh, by nine uh, uh, dissatisfied Al-Qaeda member uh, uh, and uh, then they started recruiting members from the TPP and also Afghanistan uh, uh, Taliban. Mm. So, so uh -huh. yes. Those regional countries and international actors like US, for example, how are they reacting to the Taliban in Afghanistan and what's happening in Afghanistan? Can you just tell us in the kind of few minutes left? Sure. Uh, uh, the regional state suffers from absence of a common strategy for eradication of terrorism and extremism in Afghanistan. Rather, each of these trying to resolve uh, the problem, which is related to them through different channels. For example, the China expecting Taliban to prevent the Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement from attacking against China interests. And in exchange, the China 
uh, what channeled some economic assistance to the Taliban, like uh, the China already did this one during the second half of 19th century. Iran uh, has uh, so far followed kind of uh, amiability uh, in its foreign policy toward Taliban uh, to preserve uh, its national interest in Afghanistan than contradicting with this group. Russia, if we take the uh, example, Russia has its own concern regarding the security threats uh, facing its Central Asian allies, especially from the uh, IMU address and also the Eastern Turkestan address. So, so far, the Russia has tried to convince the Taliban to prevent the IMU and uh, ATIM from spoiling security uh, in Central Asia. Pakistan backing the Taliban while expecting them yet yeah, to hand over the TPP leaders who uh, sheltered in Afghanistan. Uh, and if we take the case of India, while India so far has stayed uh, almost uh, neutral to this case. So there is no a general uh, 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 unity among the regional countries for eradication of uh, uh, terrorism in Afghanistan. So rather they are coming and each one uh, individually trying to just address their own issues. And even like, yeah, if we take the case of the United States, they are trying to chase and destroy only those potential threats to the United States and uh, to its allies, uh, uh, not, not more than that. So this kind of disunity among the uh, global community regarding the security concerns that it is emerging out of Afghanistan, it given the opportunity for the Taliban to, and, and also the other terrorist organizations inside Afghanistan to work with very uh, like uh, uh, patients and yeah, they, they, they are growing uh, their roots in Afghanistan. It is really interesting what you're saying, Mansur, because it's almost like uh, the history repeating itself. Like, you know, once again, the international community is disunited on the matters like in regard to security in Afghanistan. And they have their own groups like this time, they kind of like, they don't like a particular group. So they kind of relate to the Taliban in terms of that group, but they don't, perhaps they support other groups because they are the common enemy, uh, you know, for uh, for them. I mean, just like mind-boggling kind of like the complexity emerging, but the attitude coming from the regional and international actors is almost like what happened in the 1980s, 90s. It's just like repeat of that. And, uh, and it's really concerning because this is going to go nowhere really, you know, nice. Uh, I, can, I can see that. It's just like, uh, in a couple of years, Sam probably will be talking about, you know, well, we got to deal with the security matters in Afghanistan and kind of like Afghanistan is the kind of hotbed of terrorism, all that kind of stuff. We will come to that. But before that, though, let me just go to Nilifar. You know, Nilifar, so far what we have been hearing is about all about the kind of like the inclusivity, exclusivity, kind of the kind of the political landscape, isn't it? Like, you know, both intentionally and domestically, kind of the nation building exercise, you know, the deconstruction, reconstruction. Can you make some sense of inclusivity within the kind of the Afghan politics and what's been happening as a response in that area? Well, well before that, Dr. Zudman, uh, you ask a very um, articulate question about the, what has happened regionally and which is also quite, quite linked to, the, uh, to local uh, stuff too. Uh, there has been a policy of engagement with the Taliban from last one year, both from the regional countries, international community, and uh, that has been a, a serious push from, from, from uh, DC and from London and from all the policy places, because uh, what has been, um, uh, they are actually, I, th I think they are kind of practicing a, a pilot phase of the new Taliban. And that's how uh, the, the narrative is that let's engage with them to change them. All right, let's engage to, uh, with them in order to uh, uh, further negotiate with them on issues of inclusivity and on issues of a political settlement, on issues of uh, human rights, women rights, on issues of uh, good governance overall. So that has been a strategy so far from last one year, which hasn't proved successful, to be honest. I have written a lot about different aspects of engagement in the past. 
And I'm not convinced with the unconditional engagement. And the reason, because it hasn't really produced a concrete outcome so far, Taliban has become harder in their approaches to political settlement, which was a part of a, a, a Doha process. I don't want to call this a peace process. For me, it wasn't a peace process. It was a, a, a withdrawal um, a processes. And, but again, it had an element of a political settlement. And, and um, uh, the, the calculation was, was changed because the uh, president of the country uh, fled the country and then the Taliban uh, took power by force. So that calculation of the peace negotiation actually changed. And, and, and the, the political settlement aspect did not happen. And that kept a whole, a big question for inclusive government. So the, the issue of inclusivity is there. Therefore there, therefore, there is resistance across the country. And that resistance, what I predict is gonna grow if the Taliban and the international friends of Afghanistan will not address the issue of inclusivity because this government is not really representative, whatever regime they have. It's not inclusive of all the ethnic groups of the relig religious sex representative of different segments of society. And people will resist um, uh, both with arms and unarmed uh, uh, resistance will, will happen across the country within the next few years. Um, and that is that is actually what authoritarianism always promotes, you know, more resistance uh, because of the this this issue of exclusion that they have. On the um, on the on the whole aspect of inclusion and a political settlement and what uh, regionally and 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 uh, nationally happen, I think nothing happened um, systematically and consistently. There were events based um, uh, activities um, um, uh, in Europe and the region upon its own, upon its own, its own region uh, to bring the countries together, to bring uh, different uh, segments of society from Afghanistan together to talk about the future of the country. But most of the focus has been so much on the humanitarian um, assistance to Afghans uh, in Afghanistan and also to development, which makes a lot of sense because of the dire need and people were really dying of this issue. So that made a lot of sense. But I think now, I, bet you, I'm, I don't want to jump into your next uh, segment of the panel, uh, what can be done next based on the last one year of the all the mismatch, which did not address the issue of inclusivity, a government, a, 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 a political system in, in place, which all Afghans would, would, would favor that and also address some of the grievances of the people uh, to prevent and, and to prevent them from further um, um, uh, from further chaos actually in, in the country. I stop there and then I get back to the next uh, segment. Right. Uh, Nilofar, I love the way you are summarizing kind of the what's been happening in, in, in the name of response. Pilot phase in dealing with the new Taliban. I mean, I think that kind of summarizes really well the international community's attitude towards the Taliban. And, and what we heard from Mirvais earlier that the Taliban has become a lot more savvy as a political actor, right? You know, like <laughs> uh, it's going to be much more difficult to deal with them as a political actor now than it was in the 1990s. Look, at, uh, look folks, we have twin, uh, 25 minutes left. And this is the last part of our panel. And probably this is the most exciting part. Now, I'm going to give you three minutes each, and it has to be three minutes. And I will ask you to imagine the future of Afghanistan, like next to like three to five years, like, you know, uh, what you are expecting that is in store for Afghanistan or what might be happening in Afghanistan. So you are free to focus on a single issue or you can kind of uh, tackle this question from a you know, bigger, wider perspective, you are free with that. This is your opportunity to imagine, to uh, kind of share your trajectory of Afghanistan, uh, what's, what, what will be happening, okay? Three to five minutes from each of you, that's what I want to hear. So, uh, and I want to start with Nilifar. Nilifar, tell us what's going to happen in Afghanistan. Well, it's a tough question, and um, uh, it's extremely tough at this point. I have uh, both scenarios, negative and positive. Uh, the negative scenario is that Taliban will become harder, mm -hmm. and uh, unconditional engagement with them 
Mm -hmm. It's uh, gonna not gonna solve the issues, and uh, they're gonna put more at the table of negotiations with the West to get more money and to get recognition. Mm -hmm. That's what they're gonna do. Uh, um, especially as uh, um, um, Dr. Hassan mentioned, there are all security crises happening in in the in the country that could impact seriously the region and the global peace. So, uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, what we are seeing the, this consolidation of power phase that was one year of the Taliban. It, it, it emboldened the, the, the threats, the threats that, that could be through these uh, uh, um, uh, terrorist groups. So I think uh, the, the, the negative scenario is that they will be harder. They will put more at the negotiation table for the, for the West. And um, it will uh, give, um, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Uzerman, Afghanistan will turn into a safe haven for the insurgent and transnational terrorist groups in the region within the next three to four years, if the situation is not tackled well. So that's a negative thing. And more, of course, more people will leave the country and more poverty and, and, and a series of other uh, domestic issues because Taliban lack of uh, capable governance uh, will, will cause all those issues to rise. So that is uh, the negative impact. The positive thing, which I think we, we can see some signals from, from, from now on is that a political process to start, uh, to start uh, taking shape. Look. Uh, I think that stability, development, security, all comes or are interlinked. And the, a, a good political system or an inclusive political system is a prerequisite for all this element to happen in a society. If people are, are, don't see their representation in a system, they revolt. We have seen throughout the world, they resist. And that resistance will cause others to intervene. By other means, I, am, I mean regional countries to intervene. Afghanistan has a history of that. That creates proxy wars. That could create civil war. So the, the political system by itself is an important component. It's a big elephant in the room right now, which is unresolved. And that has to be tackled. And that could happen through a political process, which we, from a peace um, um, uh, field, we are calling it the peace process, which could have a reconciliation component and then bringing all the parties together and create a system that all Afghans want. That mm -hmm. political process has to happen. And if that happens, I think we can see a, a, a positive. And of course, Taliban could be also part of that system. Okay. Inclusion is important for all. And the other, the side by side, um, since you mentioned what, what I imagined, is that the regional component. The regional component, Afghanistan war and peace is multidimensional. The region has a, has a stake in conflict and peace of Afghanistan. Without having a consistent regional platform where all these countries can sit at the table and negotiate their interests, I don't think so this ad hoc meetings and one, one or one meeting would resolve anything in relation to Afghanistan. So that should be the parallel process going forward. So I, on the one hand, you are imagining that there will be a resistance emerging bottom up from people. And on the other end, I think the point that you are making about the negotiations, and, and it's kind of like the, uh, quite interesting that probably in that uh, process, the strongest card the Taliban might have is the kind of the insecurity in the country, all the kind of terrorist groups in Afghanistan, because you know he, they would be able to trade them somehow at the negotiation table, right? I mean. Perhaps that's what we are going to see you know, in terms of what's, what will be happening between Taliban and regional countries and, and, and global actors. Thank you very much. Now, Mansur, uh, I'm turning to you. What's your um, uh, fortune telling of Afghanistan for the next, year, next few years? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not seeing a bright future for Afghanistan, despite shallow hope that the Taliban would uh, not repeat their uh, previous mistakes and will provide the ground for a well-represented government respecting uh, their general amnesty proclamation, respecting women's rights to education, work, breaking ties with Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. However, Taliban during the last uh, 14 months uh, showing that they are not committed to any of these values mm -hmm. and uh, uh, promises. So the establishment of an absolute ethno-religious authoritarian regimes by the Taliban and their nomadic way of leadership, uh, as well as the Taliban repressive policies, particularly against women, continuous detention, torture, killing of civilians without trial, and also the Taliban policy of ethnic cleansing, particularly in the northern region of Afghanistan, 
eventually convinced a large number of uh, civilians to join armed resistance against Taliban. And recently, we heard some uh, uh, videos from General Abdul Rashid Dostan, like, yeah, he is also trying to return back to Afghanistan. So task the flame for yet another civil war has already been a spark in Afghanistan. The expansion of the ISK is uh, particularly in some provinces of Afghanistan like Kanar, Nuristan, Jalalabad, Logar, and Farah represents additional potential threats for Afghanistan and the region and the global community in the few, uh, in the few, few years later. And, and, and the, uh, like I want to conclude that in absence of a concerted effort, on the national, regional, and global arena, the growth, of, uh, the growth and expansion of terrorism in Afghanistan is inevitable. Although Afghanistan is the primary victim of the terrorism, however, I believe the security threat presented by these terrorist organizations will not limit to Afghanistan's geography in the coming years. So as soon as the international community take a collective decision regarding Afghanistan, that will save uh, Afghanistan, the region, and the world. Thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, you are not giving much hope, uh, Mansur. Uh, sounds like you know uh, the things will go back to worse, and uh, we are gonna kind of uh, see another crisis, major crisis happening uh, in the country. Now, uh, Mirais, over to you. Uh, just make it short, if possible, two to three minutes max, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, when we talk about future, we talk from now to a million years ahead. But if it is 10 years, uh, uh, I hope that uh, you also do not judge me a pessimist because I see a fact-based bottom-up approach uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, uh, what we have done, shortcomings in the past, 20 years, we have to pay now and for the future in Afghanistan. What I see in Afghanistan, the major problem is unfortunately unskilled, uh, incompetent generation uh, with, 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 with very general knowledge of you know some infor informative knowledge. Uh, because uh, annually 150,000 students we graduate from madrasas, which is surplus graduation in Afghanistan, and also from the general uh, modern schools, uh, we do not have any kind of graduation with, with competencies, with the skills. So the market does not absorb, not in Afghanistan, not outside Afghanistan. You have these generation in Afghanistan with, with, with lack of competencies and skills. In that kind of situation, even if there is inter, international intervention, even if there is support or any kind of uh, uh, resolution, it does not work as it did not work in the 20 uh, in the past 20 years taliban they recruited the new generation and all the international and regional uh, terrorist group they recruited from the young children of afghanistan the same game would continue unfortunately that is why uh, we in the five uh, or ten years ahead uh, we will have an afghanistan uh, utterly with high social and economic crisis, and also uh, uh, a threat to the international security. Thank you, Marais. Um, right. I don't know how to summarize what you just said, because what you are summarizing and what you are telling us about the future uh, of Afghanistan, um, it's gonna be really tough. And uh, you know, my concern here, particularly for Afghans and, and, and people who are left in Afghanistan and they've been, uh, they will be taking the brunt of all this um, you know, new Afghanistan emerging and, uh, and, new, uh, and the uh, future generations. And it's really so concerning. So with that, Hogai, um, I'll come to you as the last uh, person to share uh, the future of Afghanistan. Well, I do. Um, I am very interested to see whether the Taliban will do something similar to Iran, 
where they will finally recognize their limitations that they have in the fields that they're occupying. So we know that the Minister of Education and the Minister of um, just all most ministers across most of the fields may not have the education or the experience to run the fields that they are running. And so whether I'm very interested to see whether they will recognize that and whether they will recognize um, that they may be holding back the country and the fields that they're in and whether they will instead, similar like Iran, have an elected government run and they sort of go into the background and just be sort of this radical um, non-elected regime that, you know, um, will run the country, but um, whether they will allow an elected government to um, run for office and to run the fields that need to be run by people who actually have the education and the experience to run those ministries. So I'm very interested to see whether um, they will just somehow at some point um, realize this, but I do believe that they will realize this because I don't, I don't see how anyone can be a minister of any field and just, you know, justify it to themselves. So I'm hoping that um, this realization does come in at some point. And I do think if I have to fortune tell, um, my fortune telling, um, I do think that they will realize this. Because I just, I can't imagine the alternative that they will stay in those positions. It's just, it's still unreal a year later and it still seems very unreal. Mm -hmm. and just, and just one last point. I think um, just for, uh, for the audience also, the Taliban is not the only reality of Afghanistan, and, uh, and, and there are other realities too. And I think at, at one point um, the world will 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 come to that conclusion and consensus to explore other options with with the country, and also Afghans will will raise their voice too, because this is the only a, a portion of of uh, or a segment. It's not really the the only reality of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Right. Um, okay, well, I mean, obviously there may be many other factors like uh, some of the issues that you were raising regionally and globally. Uh, you just don't know. Uh, th there may be other emerging factors that may change some of your predictions about Afghanistan, but as it stands in terms of what Taliban has been doing over the last uh, year, I think it's safe to say that the situation for many Afghans will be uh, will be getting bad to worse. I mean, I think that's number one. Number two, I think the kind of the whole regional dimension and with the kind of like the proxies and, and the interest of like the certain countries on certain uh, groups, armed groups in Afghanistan and how, they, how that's gonna play out will be something to watch out. And uh, so it all depends on, you know, when the war in Ukraine will come to an end. And I think, that may also shift some attention back to Afghanistan in terms of security matters. That's a kind of factor. But in terms of humanitarian crisis that a number of you mentioned, you know, like that may require some sort of response from the international community, especially with the winter now coming up and uh, millions of people are at the uh, bread line and kind of like the situation can be really uh, gruesome for um, many of them. And, and kind of the reaction to the uh, Taliban policies, like, you know, in education, health and governance and all that, a uh, number of you mentioned the kind of the potential resistance from Afghans and how that's kind of, that might turn into some sort of uh, uh, resistance and kind of like the civil war. I mean, all these dimensions are really important to watch over the next few years. All I can say is that, you know, I think we'll be talking about Afghanistan quite a bit over the next few years. And uh, because the, the situation, the problems are still there. And, um, and with that, um, by the way, we, we have received some questions, but we won't have time really to deal with them. The, there are many questions about this security and armed groups and the regional actors, etc. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, some of them had already been responded in the second part of the discussions, but we have your email numbers in the chat room. So 
I will ask the audience if you have a specific question to any of our panelists about you know what just said. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but you know I want this kind of conversation to continue so that they can get in touch with you and kind of like uh, you, you will be able to deal with their questions in that way. But the remaining kind of like few uh, minutes, I want to kind of uh, bring everybody together here to a new initiative that we want to launch here at the Carter School because of the fact that the, 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 stress in, uh, the situation in Afghanistan is changing. And, uh, and I think it would be really wise if like-minded people get together and uh, form a group that would start thinking about the future of Afghanistan. Because one of the things that happens uh, with the regime changes or kind of military interventions and uh, stuff like that, you know, we've seen this so many times, right? Uh, the war comes to an end and then we don't know what to do. There's no plan for reconstruction, for peace building. And this time I'm hoping that we could do something different. You know, considering that we have a number of people join the session and this wonderful panels we had, wouldn't it be fantastic to form a core group of like-minded people who would have time and energy and interest to work together so that we can actually sort of put our um, energy on that very issue. So, you know, imagine the future of Afghanistan without the Taliban, for example, right? You know, what would be the kind of way forward for peace building, for reconstruction and, and uh, developing, creating that new Afghanistan, whether this nation building or women's rights, right? Uh, I think we need to be proactive about this. And I think it would be really great if you could join us in that initiative. One of the first things we want to do is to put together an edited volume that would include chapters, you know, from a very much similar perspective that we've done in this uh, uh, roundtable session. You know, in terms of um, the present and future, you know, what can be done? What are the most uh, effective responses we could imagine to deal with the current situation and the future? Who should we, uh, should we work in with in Afghanistan? Uh, who are our national partners there? Is it really realistic to expect that, you know, um, the, the international community would have that sort of um, interest in doing something substantial to change the, um, the kind of the trajectories of Afghanistan? You know, these will be some of the questions that we want to pose in this volume. And uh, so if you are interested in uh, uh, working with us, uh, in, an, in, in an initiative like that, please get back to me. And I'd love to hear from you and your interests. And, and just a short email to outline you know, why you want to be part of this initiative and what, what your contribution would look like. And, and then um, Mansur as our scholar in residence, but also um, uh, her guy obviously is one of our postdoctoral uh, 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 fellows here. We want to put that together as an initiative, but obviously Nilifar and Mirwais are close colleagues. So we already form a core group of people who have this in, uh, interest, but we want others to join us. So if you want to be part of that party, exciting initiative, working together, please get back to us, you can contact me directly and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. So let me just uh, thank all of my panelists, um, Nilifar, Ogai, Mirwais and Mansur. thank you so much. Uh, I think what you've done in the space of an hour and a half uh, was just so great. You know, uh, you uh, allowed us to have a, you know, a fairly good understanding of what's been happening over the last year since the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and what might be coming. And the uh, analytical pathways that you presented to tackle those complex issues, I think will be really helpful for everybody in this session to have a, a deeper and better understanding of the situation in the country. And so thank you so much. I really much appreciate your time, Wednesday evening, you know, being with us and, and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. And I want to really 
uh, thank our audience here uh, this time of uh, Wednesday evening, your interest for Afghanistan. Clearly you care for Afghanistan and you wanna do something about that. And I share my invitation for that. Please be part of the fun and join us if you want. And, uh, and let's see what we can do together. And I wanna uh, also thank Mercedes also who organized this event and the Peace Week in general. By the way, there are many more events coming up tomorrow and Friday, just visit our website, Peace Week website in the Carter School. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, the future for Afghanistan may be challenging, but there are so many people could make a change. You could be the agents of change for that transformational process. So you know, here's the invitation. Let's work together on that. Thank you. Thank you.